Okay, so we'll get this started. My name is Gib. Um, so I'm a kind of an enthusiast for open source. I belong to some Linux groups and that type of thing. I'm looking for ideas on what to what to present or what to talk about. And so I, I just threw this idea out there of, you know, how about uh, a little discussion about open source software for everyday use. So I, I am recording this. I hope to throw it out on YouTube at some point. Um, and send a link to Fingercon, but uh, I'm gonna throw it out there somewhere, so just be aware of that. So, um, I didn't have a whole lot of ideas on what I'd actually say once I got here. I'm doing several of these buffs, you know. So this is an audience participation type of discussion. So, you know, I'm, I'm just basically using, uh, you know, Linux distribution. I use Ubuntu, you know, for the most part. Been using Linux since like '91. It was you know very early, and uh, it just kept getting keeps getting better and better with more and more software available. And uh, I've been you know kind of negligent in learning all the new cool stuff. I've basically been using it for my primary desktop at home. I work in an environment where I don't have the option of using Linux, so. Um, Hi, Warren. How are you doing? So we're basically, you know, looking for people to talk about how they use open source uh, every day uh, for everyday type of uses. And I'm basically like I'm using the operating system for things like moving files around, that type of thing. Uh, I use a you know, Firefox browser to access the internet, and I use the LibreOffice uh, suite of software for you know every other thing. <laughs> There's a couple of software packages I use for video editing because I do some video stuff, although not very much. Just basically cutting, cutting, you know, and putting some uh, things together like that. So, what wants to give me an idea of what they talk about? Who, who, who's got an idea? What do you guys use? Follow-up question: What video packages do you use? Because I've searched around, I can't find one that's, that I consider decent. Well, so I don't really look for one that's decent. I just need a specific job done. So I, I get one that basically I need to be able to cut the tail end. You know, as I, as I turn the camera off, I wiggle it around and, you know, takes pictures of the floor and everything. And so I want to just cut that piece out. And that's really all I'm doing, just cutting pieces out of the thing that, uh, and I don't do that even quite often. So I have these really bad videos out there, you know. Uh, you know, I don't even know the names of the stuff, right? Basically, you, you go out, you look for something with a key phrase in it, and then you you do the installs, and then you start it up, and the next time you want to do something like that again, you do that same process. So you go search for software out there and, you know, install it and start using it. So I've had like four or five different, you know, video editing software that, um, yeah, I can't even remember what, what they're called, really. Well, myself, um for what tiny amount that I actually do, which is probably less than you and you. I just use a M encoder, oh, yeah. <laughs> media encoder, uh, because you can say, here, start here, go this far, stop here, as long as you know the time codes, you don't even need to see it. Yeah. And it goes just fine. <clears throat> also for transcoding, it's great, and players, media encoder, <coughs> thing. Literally. That and VLC. Well, yeah, but uh, it plays a little, I prefer just typing it up on the command line because I know it's been so long. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, do you use mostly GUI tools or do you use command line? Because I found, <coughs> personally, that I've started using the command line a lot more than GUI tools recently, just because it's faster. Yeah, you once know, you dive into it, it can be a lot faster. Well, so I sort of grew up on a command line, <clears throat> you know, one of those, that, that generation, right? Um, so I am comfortable with that. Um, so there's, you know, and the problem I have is that I can't remember all these arcane commands. <clears throat> That's why I have a cheat sheet, like yeah. just to print it off, text file that I have sitting next to my desk. It's the best way to do it, in my opinion. Yeah. <clears throat> well, see, I use so many different things, you know, so infrequently that having a list, the list, I, I need a list that tells me where my list is, and you know, just organizational skill, I guess. You know. But, you know, so you guys, when you, you're, you're using something on a regular basis, of course, you get to be familiar with it and you 
learn the commands and maybe make cheat sheets and you know do some edu you know, educational videos or something to learn a little bit more about it but I find that even a little bit hard for me to do I just you know go out there find what I want and figure it out and make it go um, there are some times I go gee I, what, how did I do this last time what was the name of that you know I've got this I don't even I couldn't even guess what the letters are but <clears throat> software that basically allows me to change the uh, um, uh, the pixel and the rate and you know the characteristics for downloading a, a video to uh, mp4 player that is like you know ancient technology and but I like because it's compact and easy to use but it goes at a, a you know slower frame rate so I have to drop it down to you know something that's a little bit easier for that device to handle so I, I, I learned there was a tool out there and I figured out how to get a file from one frame rate to another frame rate using this tool. And, but I have trouble remembering what the tool name is and something FP, you know, gobbledygook, gobbledygook, with a bunch of characters on it, something like that. Is that, you, you know, you said you have cheat sheets on some of these. So what tools are you using? Well, it depends on what I'm doing. I uh, tend to do, I personally tend to do a lot of different things. Um, everything from running virtual machines to doing video editing and audio, audio books, stuff like that. Well, it was just a, a buff on, uh, on, no, it wasn't a buff, it was a presentation on audio books. And so the guy was saying he's been doing audio books since, you know, like the 70s, and he's got, he had a lot of tips and tricks and stuff on that. And then he brought up this thing he said was, uh, um, I think he said it was shareware, or something like that. He didn't use the word open source, but I think probably it was an open source product. So a lot of people don't understand even some of that. So he's using, you know, Windows PC. He downloads the software that he gets for free, and he doesn't even understand the concept of, you know, what's going on behind. I mean, I don't know that he doesn't know the concept. I shouldn't say that. He used a term very loosely that you know, described how that software was uh, licensed. I'm sure he's very knowledgeable about licensing because he's doing audiobooks all the time. He was talking about that. Well, so, there's, so. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of definitions for software because there's, I mean, there's FOSS, there's uh, open source, and then there's free, and there's a difference between free, free as in beer, and free as in uh, freedom as uh, in speech. So and then, of I, course, I need someone to explain that. I've heard that a bazillion times. And then there's a. Uh, Where is this free beer? Well, if you think about free as in, free as in beer, it's like, um, I suppose this would be a good example of this convention. You, uh, you're paying to uh, get in, so you're paying for a lot, but they provide you free beer. Even though you had to pay the entrance fee, it still feels free. So, I mean, you're, you're paying for it somehow, but not necessarily for it itself. Okay, so I, I thought of that as um, you're sitting at a bar and somebody comes up and offers you to give, buy a drink for you, you know. So it's someone else providing that to you as a free service or free um, content. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And um, then there's free as in freedom, which is something that's just, you know, provided to you. Well, so I see that as you have a right to it. Right. So the, the government charges you taxes to use the roads, you have a right to use the roads. Right. So is the internet free as in beer, or is the internet free as in freedom? Neither nowadays. <laughs> but that's an entirely different conversation. Neither to start with, because really, somebody is paying somewhere for you to allow, to allow you to have access to the internet. Whether you're paying for the internet access yourself, for, for your, through your own ISP, or if you're using one of the old free dialogue services. Somebody's paying for that somewhere to start by an exit for that. Mm -hmm. The free dialogue is more like the free as a beer. The other one, you paying yourself, is not free. Right. But there's money always exchanging hands. With, but a freedom of information to traverse across the internet, and for any information to traverse, that's a different matter entirely. I'm not even going to go with this. Okay, so, I, so, I, so I, I'm trying to build an analogy. Right? This analogy is you go into a library, and they offer free Wi-Fi. You go into a restaurant, they offer free Wi-Fi. The expectation in the restaurant is 
you might buy some food, you might you know have some some commerce with them. In the library, it's you know it's centrally funded through some kind of you know mechanism with taxes or something of that nature. Somehow you you own a home in a community and you are taxed through that way. If you go to another library in another city, you might not be allowed to use their Wi-Fi. You may have to pay a small two dollar fee or something like that to get that access. But the only true free internet you can get is. Um it's that it's truly free to you. It don't cost you taxes or self-payment. It's if you go out and pirate it, pirate into a free open Wi-Fi signal. That's about it. It's and called borrowing your neighbor's Wi-Fi. There you go. And there was um, one of those. It was like a Dear Annie Abby um, thing or something on one of these newspapers that you know, was asking, is it is it cor is it proper to use your neighbor's Wi-Fi and so the answer given in that particular newspaper by that particular columnist was, yes, they're offering it up for free. I mean, obviously, they, they didn't you know, lock it down, so they must be want, wanting you to use it. Well, I mean, that's, of course, assuming they're not a geek like uh, a few of us and uh, sniffing your traffic to be malicious. Or better yet, setting up a free Wi-Fi point and having close for a proxy and having something like football the images of setting up. Yeah. Just for the <laughs> or uh, or surfing, serving up your own ads yeah. on every page. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a lot of malicious things you could do with a free offering a free Wi-Fi point. But shift that I'd say shift that over towards what this EOS is about is uh, open source routers. Because you can take there's open source software based off of FreeBSD, based off of Ubuntu, uh, based off of even some some generic Linux stuff that is you can download it, build to the computer, put a couple of NICs in it and start it up and you got your router. Or DDWRT, which just goes on to existing routers, like the little uh, Linksys uh, Wi-Fi points. Yeah, that's or that's open up, open, open WRT. Yeah, yeah so, few of those. so about that, I mean, so the idea is there's plenty of people offering, you know, this, this software for free that you can put <laughs> it into your router or there's people, you know, like Alinus Tavolus who, you know, provided this wonderful operating system and, you know, other germ of that and I you know personally I have not written a check to Linus I don't know you know how to how to do that I suppose I could go figure that out pretty quick there's probably plenty of people who would be willing to you know take on the role of taking my money and somehow benefiting Linus on that but I don't know if, I don't know his home phone number or, or address or anything and well, actually so most uh, projects take donations because they do it they take it and they simply donate it back to the entire project, you know. Um, most big open source projects, like uh, the Linux kernel, they take donations, which go to the developers, which are basically staff. They, this is what they do. They just work on this open source thing, and they're not getting paid by a corporation that is, you know, out there to make money. They're out, they just take what people give them to provide the service. So there's got to be like a bazillion different ways of, I like that word, that's my word for today. There's got to be a lot of different ways of, you know, doing that particular monitoring, right? I mean, uh, so, you know, I'm, I don't know, when I download software, I don't think too much about that. You know, if it's software that's provided in a repository that's available for free, I assume someone behind the scenes has done all the licensing and done all the properness and that type of thing. And so the software industry has really moved to embrace this open source concept. So when I use software that I use every day, you know, I go out there, I find some audio or video editing software that's available off the pick on my my list. I just, you know, I don't have to do all the research to figure that out. Whereas if you go out to the internet and you start looking for like music or something like that, there's people who are really concerned about, you know, just grabbing stuff without knowing the licensing behind it. Well, and that's, uh, that's an interesting point too, because if you do it in a, if you use a GUI to uh, download software, even from a repository, they tell you specifically what the uh, the license is, whether it's a uh, GPU or it's uh, I or IBM or MIT or because they're all subtly different. I mean, they're all um, they're all essentially the same. Whereas you can freely use it, distribute it, don't reuse our copy our copyrighted um, images like. Um, uh, Firefox is a prime example of that. You can use the co the uh, code to make your own version, as long as you change the um, images that are used. Like you can't use the Firefox symbol or the Firefox name, 
but you can use the code to make a new browser of your own. So they are, so the licenses are subtly different even though they're open source um, and how you're allowed to use them. So that's, uh, even inside of the open source community, um, they're still, the licenses are still actually different and specific. Uh, like the one that, uh, for TrueCrypt, is actually its own open version of an open source license. Because it's a little different than all the rest of them in the way it reads. Right, so I know that you know there's different repositories, and I've seen, in you know, like I'm using Ubuntu or whatever the distro is, and I can when I go to look at the sources that are available to me, I can select additional repositories, and there's certain ones that are turned on, you know, out of the box, right? And then there's others that are, you know, they say not supported or offered by other organizations Third that are party. still on the list, right? And then there are ways you can go out and, and search for adding more sources that, you know, you don't know what their real, you know, who is it that, that's providing that. Well, they do always tell you who's providing it. Um, like in the case of Ubuntu, third party, ones that are called third party ones, um, with every one that is an actual open source, means you have the option of actually physically downloading the, the source code for the program that, you, that you're downloading and read through it all, read through every single line of code, and compile it yourself if you wanted to. Right. Versus these uh, third-party ones, which might be proprietary. They provide you with the binaries, which will give you what you need, but you don't really know how it works. Right, so if you want to be you know, fanatical, you could do your own compiling and verifying the source and that type of thing. Um, I, I haven't really done that. I mean, that's not typically the way that I would approach that. There's actually an entire distro based off of that. Gen2. Uh, hmm? Yep, Gen2. And where you download the source code, you don't download people binaries except for something you know, to start compiling. And every single bit of software you compile is optimized for your computer, for whatever processor you have. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it makes for a slightly faster machine, but it takes a long time to load. Actually, uh, and I've looked at that recently. I mean, the, uh, the um, for Gentoo in particular, it used to be that um, only masochists downloaded Gentoo because it was so painful. They've really optimized it recently. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to do, um, even to uh, say, yes, everything's from source, but the, the process of compiling it is a lot simpler. Yeah. Or, or it does compile. Or it does compile. With some of the old versions, you would start you would start compiling the entire OS, and you have to do the entire OS and everything you choose. It stops 25% of the way through. You know? Okay, you go through the code. That's wrong. Then it stops 31% of the way through. Oh, that's wrong. Then 50%. No, that's wrong. And then 25% because something broke something else. So, so <laughs> the dependencies work fully worked out, is what you're saying? Yes, the dependencies okay. are finally fully worked out, and it actually the, the last time I installed it, it actually installed straight through. Granted, it took almost two days. Well, where an installation of Ubuntu or my favorite OpenSUSE takes a couple hours. I, I prefer to uh, do say, say it's Suzy, but Suzy, Suzy, Suzy. I, I, get, I like Suzy because I like to think of it as you know, like a, a woman that I'm interacting with. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, actually, I really like. I actually prefer that because it's. I think it's more stable myself. It ends up being more stable, yes. Um, sorry, that was a side. No, thing. no. I, this is what we're here for. I mean, so what? What is it we want to you know discuss and understand? And so, like I say, I download you know some software that I don't even know the licensing or the background for it, and I, I'm comfortable with that because it's a standalone computer that if it messes it up, I wipe it and and reload everything back in and. Uh, I, you know, that's that's become a comfortable, so, you know, and I have another computer somewhere that, it, you know, I can use in, in the case that that one causes a problem. It's a lot like I'm using XP and that's my only computer that I have to use, you know. Where did you put the license and you still have that key? Yeah, yeah, the whole thing about, uh, you know, and then of course you can't upgrade it because you need new hardware because it's so bloated and uh, so, the, you know, the open source, you know, environment is a very comfortable, easy thing to use for me. I've been, you know, maybe just because I've been using it for a while, all right? But, you know, so someone who wants to just use like Microsoft and then 
download one or two free, you know, the LibreOffice suite or something like that. I think that's even becoming more popular. I, I, don't, I don't know the numbers or anything, but since it's easy, it's got to be more popular, right? Well, that's, that's kind of how I've gotten uh, people that were using XP and, like, their machines started dying. Supposed yeah. to be a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the yearly death of the XP that happens. And uh, gave them Linux to use. As far as they were concerned, once they got over the, um, oh, it looks different, mm -hmm. it's um, actually really easy to use, especially when you say, oh, well, here, this is the, uh, the software manager. You type in what you want, and it'll automatically download and install. People actually really like that once you explain it to them. The, uh, the having a repository in particular. Yeah. yeah. Instead of having to go, okay, I'm going to search Google, and then I've got to find um, whether it's 32 or, or 64 bit executable to install, and then. Or you know, you, you go to you know one of these um, computer places and look at a rack of software on a wall, and the pretty picture one is the one you buy, and you take it back to your your home, and you you load up this this disk, and you know suddenly it, it's not working the way you want it to, and. Yeah, uh, you know that, that. Hopefully, that kind of thing is is passed. I mean, it used to be a really troublesome thing to find new software and, and make that work for you. And um, I, you know, I, I don't know that anybody personally. I don't know anybody in you know the group of people I work and talk with uh, that still does it that way. You know, uh, buy software on a disc. I mean, go out to a, a retail outlet and buy something off the shelf. The uh, the only thing I've ever seen, the only software I see on shelves are tax software and games. Well, and virus, right? I mean, so even the well, virus yes, is antivirus. Getting, but most people are actually downloading their antiviruses nowadays, yeah. unless they come pre-installed on Windows. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Another big difference between Windows and Linux world is Windows usually brand new computer comes with. Lower. How many bits of software do you need from the computer manufacturer? Mm -hmm. Samsung includes like 10 applications for no reasons. Apparently. Yeah, you can't get rid of them. You can get rid of them, but it takes a day and it shouldn't, they shouldn't even come out of it. That was something I was going to mention too. Like with Windows, when you get a new machine, it does, it comes with a lot of stuff that's using up resources that you don't, mess, mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily need. I mean, I mean, yes, they do do. They do it for a variety of reasons. Everything from uh, they're getting a kickback from the software manufacturer to they honestly think that this particular subgroup is going to want it, so they included it. Um, or you know, it's it's some kind of lead into some other product that they have. You know. Exactly. I think they double tap again. I know that does help to bring computer costs down. It does. Yeah. Because if you look into computers that come with Linux, they're generally more expensive because they can't get the, the mass market and they don't get kicked back from blowware. Okay, well, so I, I, I don't know. I, 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 certainly that sounds like a, a reasonable explanation. I don't know that that's the case. It still I, is very annoying. Well, actually, I've seen a lot of, um, a lot of manufacturers, uh, like Lenovo in particular, they'll, they'll be $100 cheaper if you get one with Linux instead of Windows. Just because they're not paying for that Windows license. Oh, Actually, the Windows license is kind of interesting because if you get a a, a piece a device that has a nine inch or smaller screen, they're no longer Windows is no longer charging a licensing fee for those devices, which I thought was kind of interesting. All right. They're clarify, going. Uh, sorry, go ahead. To clarify, I was talking about companies that offer Linux right. specifically, not companies that generally offer Windows that also offer Linux on the side. Oh, okay. I understand. Yeah, okay. So I, I could certainly see that there's a, there's a good premium that people could offer with all the software that comes with Linux, so it would be a more expensive system. Well, it's, yeah, I think because they only, they're trying to hit a niche and they have to kind of charge more to make ends meet, probably, rather than if you're selling millions of them. Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't know what the paradigm is going to be for like cell phones and that type of thing. It seems like there's you know a couple of big players in the market, and um, you know, still you're using some kind of proprietary software here and there on these cell phones. And yes, yes, and no. Um, the interesting thing about the Android versus iOS is that iOS is truly proprietary. 
Android's partially open source. <laughs> at least partially. It's not completely, but it's partially. And well, it depends on whether you are, install the completely open source version of it. There are, there, are, there are distributions that provide that, though. And you can go to something like CyanogenMod or just a basic AOA, AOKP or AOSP version of Android. And granted, you have to put that on your phone yourself. You can find that purchase unless you buy it from Google. But it's still possible to get it. I also find for Google, with Chrome, always interested me because they kind of get the best of both worlds. They have the open source Chromium, and then they take that, make whatever tweaks they want, and release it as Chrome. But they, so they go out to the community for the open source benefits, and then at the end of the day, though, the final product I believe is proprietary. Well, that's um, well, Red Hat uh, with Fedora has been doing the same thing. Same thing with uh, Suzy, and yeah, Open Suzy. So, so Linux are. Um, they go from open source and then do the enterprise version. Yeah. And then, I mean, Red Hat to um, CentOS, same thing. And that was very interesting. I use Fedora now, I kind of drifted away from Ubuntu. But, uh, I mean, I love, I love Debian, but I, I like the, uh, the Red Hat better because it's, it just feels more secure the way uh, the way it's locked down by default instead of open like Ubuntu is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but CentOS. So basically, we have Fedora, which is the community version, and CentOS is kind of Red Hat but open source and community based. Right. I mean, it's um, the only. Of course, the only difference between the between Red Hat and like CentOS is that you're you can still go and download the source for Red Hat and compile it yourself. The only thing, the reason you have to pay for the compiled version is because you're paying for the support. You're not really paying for the software; you're paying for the support. Right. You don't always though. I thought it, I thought the base one you don't even get support. You don't. Well, that's the, that's the funny thing about it. Um, the, the enterprise versions of Linux, like Red Hat or um, SUSE Linux Enterprise, is that when you pay for the product, you're paying for support for the product. You can still go out and download the entire version that you would get with the support, just without the support. It, it, it'll complain after the 30 days is up, oh, but yeah. it still works. It'll still work. Yeah. Well, you don't get updates, though. That's the thing. Uh, you can, or there are you, some you can because you can update there. the repositories. I mean, yeah. the, the software is still there. Mm -hmm. And if you actually look at it hard enough, you can remove all of the code that's, that bugs you, too. Right. That's the nice thing about it being open source. If there's something you don't like, you can remove it. Mm -hmm. Or customize. That, yeah. That's a better way to put it. You can yeah. customize it. So what other software are we using, open source software? Well, GIMP is a, is a nice uh, image editor. Yeah, so I was using GIMP in, in Ubuntu. Now, it took me three days to figure out how to draw a straight line. <laughs> yeah, it, it's you a, hold shift. It's a photo editor, not a drawer, per se. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's like Photoshop in the old days. But, but then Ubuntu went through and they removed GIMP in the, in the standard uh, distro, and you have to download it now. They have uh, some photo software that... Uh, Included instead. You know, they, they dumbed it down basically. Right. But like, like I said, GIMP is basically old Photoshop, and Photoshop has always been a very high end, um, complex piece of software. GIMP is very similar. But, and taking GIMP out, putting in some uh, little photo thing, photo editors like Microsoft's little included photo editor. It does three, four things, but that's all almost people need. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, so yeah. I, I'll use paint on a Windows box if I have to, right. just to you know circle a, a, some text and put a graphic out for it. But yeah, I I, I think GIMP was just Overkill. so complicated and so hard to understand. But once you got a hold of a couple concepts that you do on a regular basis, it was extremely powerful. Yes, it is. It's often the case if anybody's trying to use Blender. <laughs> well, I want to try to learn I Blender. Was I was going to Inkscape, too. Uh, I'm doing a couple buffs on, um, like, uh, videos and stuff like that. And I have one coming up, uh, I think it's tomorrow, on, um, you know, the cheap free software that's, or, you know, or free videos that are out there. And Blender has a whole slew of, you know, uh, things out in, on YouTube that are, you know, fun little videos that people are making really cheap. So, you know, this is going to get to the point where, 
eventually the common person on the street is going to be, I know there's like kids software now where you can do like cartoon type of level, you know, soft, uh, you know, build your little uh, video cartoon thing and it's all, you know, like a cut and paste kind of approach. So, you know, these kids coming up nowadays are going to be able to do the, uh, the you know, Hollywood graphic, you know, quality, you know, video without too much effort given, you know, several years of development yet.